Here's what's coming up on your horizon. The U.S. military is the largest, best trained fighting force in the world. But what happens when soldiers take off the boots? You put in your time, you did the hard tours, and you want to go home and enjoy your family. Will your military experience be able to cross over? Will it be enough to secure a job on the civilian sector? I know what I've done, but to turn that into a civilian uh, understood piece of paper that you're going to hire me on, it's kind of, it's really intimidating. Today, we examine the transition from soldier to civilian. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech, a job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Welcome to Oklahoma Horizon. I'm Austin Moore, in for Rob McClendon. Well, our military trains relentlessly to take raw young men and women and craft them into focused, driven soldiers. Nothing quite sums up the effort, the goal, and the result of this process quite like the soldier's creed. Recited for us here by Private Second Class David Perez. The soldier's creed, I'm an American soldier. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. I saw the people of the United States to live the army values. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined physically and mentally tough. Trained proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I will always obtain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I'm an expert and not professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I'm a guard of freedom, the American way of life. I'm an American soldier. So soldiers are taught to adapt and overcome any obstacle, but there may be none more daunting than the civilian world waiting for them once they step back from the line. Still, every career must end, whether from retirement, medical issues, or simply a desire to try something new. But just because you see it coming doesn't make it any easier. I started this battalion as a private back when it was in Germany, 4th Battalion, 3rd Air Defense Regiment. 27 some years ago and then now I'm back as the battalion sergeant major which kind of for me looks like a full circle and it might be God's way of opening the door for me to walk out. You put in your time, you did the hard tours and you want to go home and enjoy your family. The stresses in the military is different from when you go home to that spouse or those loved ones or those kids and oh by the way she puts pressures or the children put pressures on you that the army can never match up. Most people don't understand that family sacrifice. The spouse feels it, no one else can see it, but your kids have to live through it. So when you're gone for the birthdays and you're gone for all the different events and things like that, you come back and you realize you, you missed out on so much, you want to redeem that time back. So you could deal with the military aspect, but you go home and that stress is there and it's real. And if you don't connect with someone else that can help and relate to what you're dealing with and kind of guide you through it, it could be overwhelming. They treat volunteer work as actual work. I am a spouse. Um, I'm a military spouse of an active duty so soldier. You go from a life where you are guaranteed a roof over your head, um, you're guaranteed a paycheck, and basically right now we're guaranteed food to eat, but once you get out, um, you're guaranteed none of that. Uncle Sam is not there to feed you or clothe you or house you. I came into the military when I was 19, so in essence, I matured in the Army. And when you're serving in the military, you always hear that it's going to be a difference when you become a civilian. It's not going to be the same. <laughs> and will your military experience be able to cross over? Will it be enough to secure a job on the civilian sector? I mean, the last time I worked in the civilian sector, I was a teenager. I was working in, you know, mom and pop fast food from home. I know what I've done, but to turn that into a civilian uh, understood piece of paper that you're going to hire me on, it's kind of, it's really intimidating. It's not as simple as taking a job description from the military's website and putting it down on my resume. You need to really think about 
what it is that I truly do and how that translates into the civilian workforce. It's partly translating uh, military into civilian jargon. It's also capturing all the small things that we do in the military that we don't think that we do. You just say, oh, it's part of my job. Yeah, it is part of your job, put it on paper. You have to cater each resume to a job. So job A, resume A. Job B, resume B. Job C, resume C. And it takes, it takes a lot of time to do each resume, and a lot of people don't realize that, and ju they just hand out this generic resume. Give me this, give me this, I'm a veteran. When I was a platoon sergeant, and I had a soldier lose his dorm room key, I just handed him a cinder block and tied the key to it, and was like, now will you forget your, your key? Um, I can't do that here in this environment. <laughs> um, so I have to find other ways to encourage them. I first enlisted in 2005, in the 145th Army National Guard Band. I've been in the reserves, it'll be a year in March. I've had employers in the past who just get really frustrated with that commitment that I've made. And so they don't see the, the physical strain, they don't see the mental strain and the emotional strain. I've already been away from my family. I'm just coming back, I have to go back to work. I have to turn off Army and turn on civilian. Um, that's, that's hard to do. It, it, that, that's hard to do. It's sometimes very difficult to make that switch and be like, okay, I'm, I'm dealing with real people now, so now I need to calm down and not tell them what I think with my command hand. When you have ch um, those challenges with employers who aren't willing to work with you, it, it, it really burdens the soldier. Um, I know it burdened me because I felt like I wasn't doing my best in my military profession because I was so worried about losing my my civilian profession. Get networked into resources. Get networked into programs that will help in that transition. Because for many of us, you don't have the programs and or those network abilities to get out there and do that before you get out. But you can't just go out there and say, I want a job, any job. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. And if you can make some money doing something that you like doing, why not? It's about what is your goal for your family? and how can we help you? And I say we mean the resources, the abundance of experiences out here on this side of the, of the uniform to help you achieve what your goals are. Don't be afraid to hit apply now and put yourself out there. When we return, we'll take a look at a program designed to smooth that transition and the partners that are making it work. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Soldier for Life is an Army program designed to connect with government, educational institutions, and employers. The goal is to help veterans and their families reintegrate into civilian society. Now, while the program has had success in connecting exiting soldiers and jobs, there is a recognition that more can and should be done. That led to a recent military transition summit at Oklahoma's Fort Sill. Rob McClendon has the story. It was a packed house in Fort Sill's Snow Hall when Staff Sergeant Carlos Muniz took the floor. I joined the Army in October of 2000 as a member of the Puerto Rican National Guard as a 14th Sierra, which is a Avenger crew member. Down the road, I transferred over to a 14 hotel, which is early warning system operator addressing military, government, and education leaders at the Soldier for Life Military Transition Summit. Mooney says he left the service only to re-enlist a year later. Well, the hardest part of things is being away from the family. With the Guard, I did two deployments. I did a, uh, eight months and I did a 15 months in Afghanistan. So being away from them is always hard. It seems that when you're gone, things start happening. You know, kids get sick, you know, you got trouble with, you know, in school. I decided to try my luck in the civilian world. As you can see, it didn't go too well for me. I got out of the Army and I was like, what did I do? I was not prepared to get out. A problem not unusual for service members, but one the Soldier for Life program hopes to address both with the hiring event like the one here at Fort Sill and by encouraging employer military partnerships like the United Association Veterans in Piping Program. This program has been explained to me as trying to drink from a fire hydrant. You just kind of put your head in there and get as much as you can and then back out and take a breath for a second. 
This is an 18-week program delivered to active duty servicemen and women here on base that replaces the first year of a five-year apprenticeship in sprinkler fitting. We get a great deal out of this by getting the military people because of the discipline that they already have. When they leave here, they have more tools than what they need to be successful. We train them in here on valve training, uh, soldering, brazing, crane signaling, rigging, uh, OSHA 30. We're finding the employer before they get there. So they're, they're not getting training and then having to find employment like most uh, schooling does. Here, we have employment for them. So we go out, we do the groundwork, find where they're gonna be, the best contractors for them, the best areas to go back to. And a similar partnership has been built with Ryder Trucks. The guys that all finished uh, four engine manufacturers with Cummins, Detroit, Navistar, and Mack Volvo. And then up here, we come up here and we're doing the hands-on portion. And uh, these guys will actually get out and work in the shop uh, with the guys in the shop, just like they would in a normal uh, uh, Ryder location. And when they get out of this program, then when they graduate from this program, they're gonna go to a Ryder shop and actually go to work. I have a, a little book about this thick of certifications now. I, I had my first paycheck from Ryder before I even collected my last paycheck from the Army, so, wow. I mean, there was never a break in pay at all, so, you know, that, that's, that's usually a huge stress factor when you're getting out of the military, is, you know, financially, am I going to be okay? It's absolutely a perfect fit. In fact, first, the uh, first group we have, four of the guys have already been promoted. That's how well they fit into the program so far. These guys already know what they're going to do. They already know where they're going to go. It takes that total, all that stress. So when they come into Ryder, I mean, it's just, you can just come in and go to work, fully trained and ready to go. The nonprofit Warriors for Wireless doesn't hire veterans directly, but does train them for a career with a sky-high limit. The industry overall has an aging population of tower technicians and broadband technicians. We're training veterans to fill those roles going forward. There's a huge demand out there. We have over a thousand openings around the country. So one of the things we always ask veterans, like, where do you want to live? And then we find a tower company in that area that needs an employee right now. They were able to get me into the program, get me started, get me trained, get my certs, transitioned over from the military into the wireless industry. And now I have a job where I provide for my two kids without any, any hesitation and very successful. Um, Marine Corps teaches you leadership. They teach you take fear, put it behind you, and get the mission done. And I, in the wireless industry, that is something that you definitely have to be able to do. I mean, your office is on the ground, minus 300 feet in the air. There's a lot of work going forward, and if we look at how many towers we have in the U.S., there's 30,000 towers in the United States. Uh, of those, 27% are really aging and need to be replaced. On top of that, we know that with small cell technology and all these other things, the demand is expected to be 130,000 towers by 2030. That's a huge growth industry, uh, and they're looking to hire veterans. The state of Oklahoma is fortunate in that we've got an outstanding workforce and a great work ethic. The unfortunate thing is we simply don't have enough workforce. Scott Smith is with Oklahoma Career Tech and sees veterans as a great opportunity to expand the number of employable Oklahomans. We want them to have a great career, and that's what Career Tech's focus is, is to help get folks skilled and get them hooked up with the right companies. But also, we're trying to find creative ways to reach into pipelines of outstanding workers to help them to leverage the training that we offer, but also leverage the jobs that we have in the great state of Oklahoma. Pairing industry education and government with veterans who often don't know their own worth. So like we say, you don't have a career ladder, you have a career cargo net. Because you ever climb the cargo net? Yeah, yeah. You don't climb straight up, yeah. right? You gotta go over, you gotta move it up, and get your best foot hold. Better understand that challenge, I spoke with Oklahoma's Secretary of Veteran Affairs, retired Major General, Miles Deering. How important is it to bring industry, military, education all together in an event like this? Well, it's, it's tremendously important because uh, it uh, enables us to, to create a collaborative effort in helping these young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, transition from the military life to the civilian life. What type of asset are veterans to just Oklahoma's economy? They're a tremendous asset to our economy and to the state of Oklahoma. I mean, uh, these young men and women bring the values that they've, uh, that they've lived 
and uh, they practiced in the military to the community. And those kind of values are what we value most as a society. How can the Department of Veterans Affairs, how can it help Oklahoma veterans? Well, I think we can help in the transition and the linkage. And once that soldier leaves military duty, active duty, and goes to his home station, uh, what helps him make that link up? And I think that, that we as the State Department of Veterans Affairs can help him with that link up. In other words, where he leaves the active duty and where he enters a civilian life, we still need to have that continuity of care. We need to ensure there's a link there that ensures that his future is assured as well. What is that first? What's, what's the first step that needs to happen then when someone you know, leaves the military? Well, the first step is that person needs to, to, to make contact with his, in my opinion, he needs to make contact with his State Department of Veterans Affairs. This, is, this ensures that, that if he wants to go to college or he wants to go to career tech or she wants to go to college or career tech, that they understand the resources that are available in the state. If they want to apply for their claims and benefits with the VA, we can help them do that. If they're seeking employment, uh, we can help them do that as well. I'm going to use all the tools that the Army has to offer to get ready to be a successful civilian once I transition out. And for Sergeant Muniz, seeing all these opportunities and taking the reins on what he can accomplish now, he's much more confident about his eventual retirement. I'm working on a bachelor's degree in uh, sports psychology, so I know I'm going to be uh, prepared when I leave the military. Plus, the military has a lot of great programs that's going to help you, you know, prep for when you decide to hang those boots for good. And I'll be ready. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. So far, we've talked today about hiring from the soldier's perspective, and they can gain a great deal but they also have a great deal to offer. Soldiers train daily in areas far broader than most of us realize. But rather than have me explain why you should hire soldiers, we thought they could tell you better themselves. In the military, when soldiers get to do something new or they get the chance to show what they've learned or use what they've been trained to do, that's a really great feeling because soldiers want to go. Soldiers want to go and they want to do their job and they want to do it expertly and they want to get it done and they want to move on and they want to do the next thing because that's, that's how we soldier. Go! Well, it's an amazing thing. I, I talked with a company one time. They said they're looking for three things. Somebody that can show up on time, that can accomplish the mission inside of a time frame and get along with others. And I told them, I said, that's it. I can do that falling out of bed because uh, our soldiers are that. They're, they're disciplined, uh, they're accountable, they have attention to detail, and this is my junior level uh, from specialists and below. Those soldiers come in here and they are just ready to get after it. They're meticulous, uh, and like I said, you know, I can count on them. If I give them a mission, I know it'll be done. We in a day and time now, people just not showing up for work. So for you to have someone that sort of you can, you know, draw the rings and bring people back in and set the standard in the office, it makes for a better workplace. I know that I get frustrated when I'm not challenged and that's, that's a problem that I have come across with just about every job that I've had is I'm like, I can be more, I can do more, I know how to do this, let me do this. And it, it kind of feels like a bridled horse that you've got to slow down because soldiers know, we know how to do things. Teamwork, one team, one fight. Yeah. One team, one fight. So team building, I mean, that is the very core, the fabric of the Army, of any military force. And you have to make the team work. Uh, you learn how to lead, and leadership is a, a foundation for our, our units. You just need to be able to adapt and overcome, uh, fit into the the surrounding elements, but not lose yourself at the same time. So they don't just solve the problem, they also look at other policies and procedures that are out there that may be a better way to work or to identify something else that can aid individuals along the transition and not just their in particulars. So they come with a big dynamics of flexibility, the problem solving skills, but also the ability to reach out and use resources that's going to aid back into other employers as well. So every soldier who comes out of the Army has done a PowerPoint. 
Every soldier who comes out of the Army has done stuff on Microsoft Word and Excel, so they have hands-on experience on office environment work that they don't even realize. So I get a lot of soldiers who come into my office and they say, Missy, I only know how to blow things up. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You know how to do many other things. So you're getting someone who understands different leadership styles. You're getting someone that understands different personality types. In the Army, people come from everywhere. And we have to learn how to work with all different kinds of people, different nationalities, different races, different skin color, you know, hair color, eye color, whatever. And, and you have to learn to work in that realm. Well, diversity is a, a huge benefit. And we do, we do it every day through classes and and knowledge and teaching, people get to understand what diversity really means. Whatever you grew up with, whatever notions or beliefs, when you come into the military, you come in contact with so many different people, good and bad, that you can, whatever your bias was, it could be disproven. People that don't believe in diversity don't understand it because they haven't been taught it. And I think us in the military, teaching people's backgrounds and actually going through it and understanding that that person beside me is a person. That's all they are, is a person. And I, I have, all I ask them to do is to have my back. I got their six, they got my six. Ready, go! Ready, one, ready, ready, two! So I was deployed to Katrina back in 2005. I was in charge of refueling operations for the uh, French Quarter. I never thought that I would have to be on guard at the level I was on American soil. I, I think it's entertaining when your peers at a civilian work environment get stressed out over something small. I can look at it, laugh, and say nobody got shot, nobody lost an eye, and they're going to be back tomorrow. Let's move on, figure out a way to get through this problem. It's not that bad. So the college personnel that come out, you know, those kids straight out of school, they don't understand that you have to have courses of actions one, two, and three because the day is not perfect. So those are the things that my soldiers come into and are ready to do. Um, and we're doing it without even knowing if we're doing it. That's the greatest thing. You know, soldiers are resilient. So regardless of what you throw at us, we understand you can't give us too much because you're gonna get tired. So we just endure the process until you're tired and we just eat it up. It's like a plate of food. I'm always hungry. You can only bring so much because your cooks can't keep up. You wake up and you're 15 minutes prior to any meeting and then when you're there, you're executing and taking notes and then after the notes, you go back and you follow up with uh, the answers to those notes that were you know, charged with you to understand. And there are times that I've met civilian corporations that just did not do those things and it, it baffles me and they wonder why uh, their companies are hurting. And it just sounds like they need some good soldiers. Want to see more stories like this? All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Over the years, we have covered any number of veteran stories, but none more inspiring than that of Noah Galloway. On his second tour of duty in Iraq, an IED took Galloway's left arm and leg. Galloway worked his way back from those injuries and the depression that followed and now works as a personal trainer and motivational speaker. In 2015, Galloway rose to fame as a competitor on Dancing with the Stars. I don't do it for the money, there's bills that I can't pay. I don't do it for the glory, I just do it anyway. And I will always do my duty, no matter what the price. That was a pivotal moment for me, and that was week five, halfway through the competition, and I wasn't sure how long we were gonna last. I was kind of losing motivation, but the reaction from people changed everything because of that one dance, that one song. Now, if you'd like to see our complete story with Galloway or any of our other veteran stories, we have a special playlist available at our website, okhorizon.com. They've been called an endangered species. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at small town, downtowns, and the people helping revive them. So it's been amazing. Uh, we help them with information around town about where to go and what to do. 
They say that once the money comes into a town, it passes at least three times through the town before it's gone. Small Town Downtowns on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. That's going to wrap us up for today. You can see more of our stories on our website at okhorizon.com. Follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OK Horizon TV or like us on Facebook. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Austin Moore. Rob McClendon will be back next week. We hope to see you then. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Thank you.